The Boys and the Boat by Daniel James Brown Basic Concept of the Book The book The Boys and the Boat is a story of the nine struggling boys and the rise to the winning podium. Protagonist Jules Rance struggled through his personal life, yet stays adamant to achieve what he thought he belonged to. He comes to the University of Washington and gets himself a place in the rowing team. He thought that being an Oseman would help him strengthen his position in school and in Washington. With numerous undulating domestic wins and losses, he and his boys slithered their way to the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Despite being snubbed by Nazis, they win the gold by pulling ahead of Germany by the last second. Main points in the book There are a few critical ideas in the book that a person comes to know while perusing, since the book is a work of narrative non-fiction. Therefore, ample room is there for critically analyzing the scenarios in the midst of the Great Depression that the United States of America hitherto faced. Huge competition for spot in rowing team in 1933, the United States of America was in the middle of the Great Depression. One-fourth of the population was unemployed, and over two million people were homeless. The time was very tough on the American. People were barely affording their meals. The stress was so much that people had to come down to the level of merely carrying out their subsistence. Looking for quality education and healthcare had become a luxury only a few could afford. Rowing team was one of the opportunities in the University of Washington, amid such stress that everyone would run after. There was an extraordinary competition. Al Albrechtson, a strict rowing coach, pushed the candidates to the limits during the trials. The number of candidates dropped to having a couple of weeks. Joe Rance, due to his royal background, made it, and so did Roger Morris, as he had rowing experience in the past. Joe Rance's tough past and his tenacity. Joe Rance was born in 1914 in Spokane, Washington. He had one brother. His father Harry was an automobile mechanic. Joe's mother died when he was only four. His father abandoned him and went to Canada. He was left to live with his brother and aunt. After a couple of years, Harry came back. He remarried and tried to be a good father. The stepmother of Joe was not good with him. She always thought of him as a reminder of her husband's first wife. Joe's father and stepmother, Thola, had two kids. Her hatred for Joe continuously increased, and she threatened to leave the house if Joe were to live in the house. Joe lived in the squim, while the rest of the family moved. He kept his spirit high and plunged into the business of bootlegging, which proved to be lucrative for him. He didn't leave the study and kept himself enrolled despite all the odds. After finishing school, he got admission in the University of Washington. The build-up of rowing team Building a team is not an easy task. In rowing, teamwork is even more important. Rowing demands synchronicity. A single mistake or losing the harmony between the rowers could be disastrous. The front rower sets the speed, and the last person in the boat, called Coxon, passes the orders. When the rowers achieve the rhythm in unison, the boat cruises seamlessly with the desired pace. The faster the rowing, the difficult it gets to maintain the swing. Therefore, it is extremely critical to row in perfect harmony. Developing this skill is hard. Coach takes extreme care in selecting the right rowers. After rigorous trial, Coach Bowles named the freshman's team. Roger Morris was first, Shorty Hunt was second, and Joe Rance was third. George Pocock's Influential Boat George Pocock made the best boats. He hailed from London. His family made boats as boat making was his family business. As a smart person, he not only did pick up the trade, but also brought in innovation. 
He studied racing techniques, and keeping them in mind, he designed phenomenal racing shells. He was working in Canada Rowing Club when the father of Washington Rowing, Hiram Conover, spotted him. He implored George Pocock to come and build boats for the University of Washington. George proved to be magnanimous, and even refined the rowing style that came to be known as a Conover Stroke. The Conover Stroke proved fruitful for the team. George Pocock's discovery of Western Red Cedar revolutionized the boat building. Boat from Western Red Cedar was buoyant, light, and faster than boats made of mahogany and spruce. Domestic Rowing Competitions The two races, the Pacific Coast Regatta and the Poughkeepsie Regatta, were the important events. Tom Bolas had not lost the Pacific Regatta in six years. The team of University of California was a concern, while on the other hand, the coach had a few reservations for Joe Rance. Joe was also used to be picked on by his teammates because of his clothes and banjo playing. The team performed well, despite the concerns of coach Bolas. The Pacific Regatta arrived. To everybody's surprise, the University of Washington won. They beat the Berkeley with four and a half lengths and went on to set a new freshman record. The University of Washington eventually won. Sophomore year and Olympic dream. After phenomenal victories, media has started speculating about the team being bound for the Olympics 1936 at Berlin. The coach Al Albrechtson gathered the team and motivated them that going to the Olympics should be their goal. Other teams with the hopes had started beating sophomores, which could put them in trouble. They strengthened their standing of going to the Olympics by the constant motivation of the coach and winning the Pacific Coast Regatta. Prevailing confusion about sending the sophomore boat to Olympics. The varsity team had performed better than the sophomore team. Their being in limelight caused confusion. Coach Albrechtson was not content. There still was a chance because of the upcoming Poughkeepsie race. The tough competition was there. By the end of the race, the sophomore team won, but I was still not sure as to who would end up going Berlin. The rowers were out of shape, and they need more hard work to make their dream come true. Hitler's Grand Preparation for Olympics Hitler was preparing for the Olympics. He found that the Olympics would be the best chance for him to show the world about the grandiosity of Nazi Germany. He hired Leni Riefenstahl, who had previously served as a propaganda minister. She made a movie called Olympia. Hitler also thought that he would successfully be able to hide the real nature of his rule. He made the Roma families evacuate and move them to inconspicuous places. He stopped the publication of anti-Semitic pamphlets. Mixing up of rowers for perfect time. In January 1936, Coach Albrechtson gathered all the teams and started mixing the rowers for finding the perfect team. After due experimentation and deliberation, he found a team which included Don Hume, Joe Rance, Shorty Hunt, Stuff McMillan, Johnny White, Gordy Adam, Chuck Day, and Roger Morris. All the rowers had one thing in common. They all hailed from rural backgrounds. None of them was from a wealthy family. They all had to work hard to earn money so they could stay in school. These tough times in their lives had made them tenacious and determined against odds of any kind. The similarities in them brought them closer to each other and made them the perfect team for an event like the Olympics. The Princeton Race The team right from the beginning of the year performed well. The team backed both Pacific Coast Regatta and Poughkeepsie Regatta. The Husky Clipper which was the name of the newly formed team, had beaten the Californian team with the three lens. 
One of the team members, Bobby Mock, applied his trick when he began at a slow pace so he could save energy for the end. The trick helped and the Bossidy boat took the lead and won by a full length. This fantastic victory helped them go for the Olympic qualifying race at Princeton. In the beginning, at Princeton race, they had a shaky start, but they recovered soon and pulled hard losing Pennsylvania and California. After winning this race, they were bound to go to Olympics 1936, for which they had dreamt and worked for. The Berlin Race The Osman from the United States of America arrived in Berlin on the 23rd of July, 1936. They had started facing travel right from the beginning after they landed. Bobby Mock had gained weight because of excessive buffet eating. Likewise, Don Hume had become ill. He had got the respiratory disease. The disease got him bedridden. Things had not been going in their favor. Coach Albrechtson was told that the team would be in the sixth line. The sixth line was the outermost and was susceptible to the adverse effects of weather and wind. Giving the US the sixth line was a deliberate attempt of snubbing them. Nevertheless, the race began. The team started rowing with a steady pace so they could save some energy for the end. Don Hume, who was very ill, had his eyes shut. Mock yelled at him, but he had given no response. Nearing the end, Hugh miraculously opened his eyes and saw that Mock was yelling. Pick her up! One length to make up! 600 meters! Mock kept shouting until they finished first, followed by Italy and Germany. The United States of America's rowers prevailed and backed the gold medal. Rise of the American Boys from the Ashes the victory for the boys in the 1936 Olympics is quintessentially a case of rising from the ranks. Amid severe economic depression, when many of the people were not even ready to take part in the Olympic Games, American rowing team outperformed everyone. All the odds were stacked against them right from the start. They worked hard, they stood adamant in achieving their goals. In the end, after defying all the odds at home, when they reached Berlin, they were not ready to lose. One team member gained weight, while another became bedridden. Despite such condition, on the day of the race, the boys from economically depressed America prevailed. They rightly deserved the victory, and so they tasted it.